Okay, so welcome to Faith and Trust in God, part three. Um, we are part one was really more of an introduction, um, and part two, we started the actual text. Um, we have been studying the Chovas Halavavos, Sha'ar HaBitachon, the, uh, the book Duties of the Heart by Rabbi Bachia, Ibn Pakuda, um, and particularly the fourth gate. As we mentioned, Rabbi Pakuda lays down a firm statement that he believes that in, that in, that in Judaism, um, it's not just about Chovas HaEvarim, and he felt that there was enough uh, scholarly works on that, Chovas uh, HaEvarim meaning obligations or duties that we have to do with our, with our limbs, so the, the obligation that we have to put on tefillin, the obligation that we have to lend money to another, the obligation that we have you know, not to steal, etc., to be moral and upstanding citizens, etc., he says, but beyond that, and he, where he felt uh, Jewish work was lacking, was with regards to Chovas Halavavos, the duties of the heart. Uh, and so he, 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 he kind of divides his, uh, his, his treatise into multiple gates. Uh, and in each gate, he discusses one of the duties that he feels are necessary for the heart. Um, he, he, he has already spoken about the, 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 the duty that we have to serve God, the duty that we have to be humble, the duty that we have to develop a love for God, a fear for God, and or a reverence for God, etc. cetera. Um, and, and, and those have not been the topic of our class. So we've been talking about the obligation that we have to develop a trust in Hashem. Um, and in prior class, we've discussed what it means to have a trust in Hashem beyond having belief in God. In other words, there's one, it's one thing to believe in a God. It's, an, it's quite another to actually believe in Him in a way that we trust in Him. Um, uh, to give the example, with just to kind of recap in short what, what we discussed uh, prior, uh, to give the example between human beings, right? It's one thing for, for you to believe that I have the ability to, uh, to hold whatever it is, 200 pounds, right? And to believe, yeah, whatever he says, he works out every day and he can hold 200 pounds in his hand. No problem, I believe him. It's quite another thing to actually be able to, to lean backwards, right? The, the trust fall, hence the name, um, and just say, I'm, I'm, what, you know, he's going to catch me and he can, he can support my weight um, and, and just me holding out my hands to trust me that I'll actually be able to catch him. Um, and this is a perfect segue to recap last week's lesson, where last week's lesson, Rabbi Pekuda opens up by sharing with us seven prerequisites, which he feels there are in, in, in trust in any relationship. And last week we stressed that while some or a, 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 a portion of some of them can be found between human beings, he's obviously leading up, and that's where we'll get to today, to show that these things are in, in their ultimate, can only be found with God. To trust in Hashem is, uh, uh, demands a prerequisite of seven, sorry, any trust demands a prerequisite of seven things. And to, re, to recap those seven things really briefly, and that's where we'll pick up today, after those seven things, he says, number one is to believe that the person has a, a, a feeling of compassion, of love, of, uh, of, 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 of uh, respect towards you. Um, that person has feelings towards you, positive feelings towards you, love, respect, compassion. That's obviously the first ingredient whenever uh, uh, we, we want to establish trust in another being is to understand that that person loves you. Number two would be to understand that even beyond the love that that person has, he actually knows what your needs are, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's one thing to say this person loves me. It's another thing to say this person loves me and also knows what I need in my life. And that's why I trust them to guide, to guide me in, in, in my life. Number three is that that person is actually strong. And by strong, we mean physically, but also mentally. In other words, this person has the capability to fulfill whatever it is that I'm trusting them with, right? So if you have a doctor, it's not just enough that that doctor loves you. It's not just enough that that, 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 that doctor um, actually knows what's necessary for you. He also has to have the physical capabilities, whether that's physical strength or whether that's mental prowess that he, or, or talents that he has to be able to do whatever it is that you need. Um, number four, um, is that he knows the interests of the person, is that the person that you intend to trust has to know the in, your interests in order to know how they can best serve you. Um, so 
you know, there's, it, 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 again, it's one thing if they, if they love you, but it's a, quite another thing if they know what it is that's best for you and they actually have your best interests at heart, which kind of ties together with love, but they can be separated. So that, that, that helps to be able to trust the person. In a physical relationship, I gave the example of spouses who usually after a couple of years know each other's tastes, whether that's in clothing or whether that's in food, uh, I know with my wife, often I'll, I'll be picking up sushi and I'll text her and say, hey, are you in the mood of sushi? And she'll say, yes, I trust you. <laughs> you know, you get whatever role you think I would like. Um, it would be silly of her to trust me if we had only been married for uh, one month or if we had only uh, known each other for one month. Um, there's, no, there's no possible way that I could possibly, beyond the fact that I love her and that I want what's best for her, etc. I have to actually know what's at her best interest. I have to actually know what it is that she likes, what, what it is that would be best for her. So again, in, in a relationship, if we're going to trust someone, we have to know that they have our best interests at heart and that they, and that they know what our interests are. Um, number five. Yes, number five is experience. Um, we have to know that the other person knows our experiences. This, again, be, uh, or not again, for the first time, begins to touch on a, relation, on, on, on a level of trust that we can probably only have in the Almighty, but spouses is probably second best here. Um, the more that someone knows you, or, or probably spouses is actually not second best. A, a parent is probably second best for this one. Um, there has to be experience that that person knows what you've been through throughout your life. Uh, one, of, one, one, one of the core issues between, you know, the lies in trusting someone, um, a medical professional here would also be a good example, is that if they don't know your prior experience with the medical professional, that can be because of your um, having had a different, different doctor beforehand, et cetera, or if it's a parent, then it's, you know, they, they know you from when you've been a young child. That's a crucial element. Um, and number, let me hold number six, number seven. Yes, number six, again, this one is specifically with regards to the, to the Almighty, with regards to God, is that everything has to be in his ability, right? We all know that we have people that we trust them and they have our best interests at heart and they really know us well and they really try to, try to do the best for what's, what's in store for us, but they don't control, not, not all the cards are in their hand, right? They, they don't control every element of what's going on here and some things they need to rely on others for, et cetera. Hold on just a moment. Let me just let some people... That are waiting to join the class in. Welcome, Stephanie. Welcome, Marguerite. And number seven is that the person who you are relying on, the person who you are trusting, has to actually be somebody who is naturally kind and caring and, 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 and wants to do kindness for others. In other words, they might yeah. love you, but there might, there might be something else that will hold them back because they're not fully... You know, that whatever that is, whether we feel that their own interests will come first, whatever, it has to be somebody who's actually completely given over in a way that, they're, that they are a naturally loving and kind person and puts other people before themselves. So these are the seven uh, um, uh, prerequisites to trust anyone. So uh, mm, hold on. So that's number seven. That's where we were. Okay. So uh, why don't we start off with this paragraph here, which we already did last week. Um, Arnold, why don't you read for us? I just unmuted you. If you can, please, number 10. So whoever combines these traits. Okay. Whoever combines these traits, in addition to all of the previous traits, has combined all of the conditions that deserve trust and would obligate the person who knows this, uh, this uh, to trust him. Who knows this? This uh, to, who knows this to trust him? I didn't understand that, uh, and would obligate the person to, who knows this to trust him. Okay, uh, to be at, at peace inter internally and externally. So in his hold on, just one second. If I may clarify that for you, right? What what he's pointing out to us here is that these seven prerequisites. If you should find someone, right? and of course, he's talking about God, and he's going to get to that in today's lesson. Um, if you should find someone that has all seven of these things, you would be obligated to trust them. And we don't mean obligated. Of course, every person has freedom of choice, but we mean right, right. it would be it would be silly not to trust a being like this that has all seven of these things at their disposal. Got it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, 
uh, to be at peace internally and externally in his heart and in his limbs and to give himself up to him and accept uh, his decrees and judge, uh, judge him favorably in all of his judgments and actions. To presume that certainly every, everything is good and even when what seems bad is actually good. Right? So um, last week somebody asked me who ML is. Um, uh, I, I know that T, uh, so, so you, somebody had asked about TL and about ML. Uh, TL is the Torah Salavavos, which I know is one of the commentary on the Chova Salavavos. ML, I have not looked into yet. I don't know which commentary it is, but they're quoting a commentary here. And their point is, well, or at least this, this particular commentary's point is, right, that when you have someone like that, and, they, and that you can actually trust them based on these seven prerequisites, so then you can assume that everything that they're doing is good. And even if something bad comes from them, you assume, because you know that they're loving, because you know they have the, their, your, your best interests at heart, because you know they have the ability to fulfill those interests, because you know that they, they, they know all of your experiences that have happened till, up till now, all the seven things that we discussed, so therefore you can assume that even if something seems bad, it's probably good in the long run for you right. because you trust them so much. And, uh, and he recaps here something which we mentioned in our introduction. We didn't study Rabbi Pikuda's entire introduction, but... Um, he does discuss this in his introduction, uh, which is that w what are the benefits of trusting in Hashem? And he discussed multiple of them. We, we, we went through them in class number one. Uh, and now's a great time to add as a parenthetical. If anybody has missed class number one or number two, they are both on my YouTube channel. If you search Rabbi Zoshi Rifkin, Faith and Trust in God, uh, you probably shouldn't need to type in that much, but it should, shouldn't be that difficult to find. Pasadena Jewish Academy on YouTube. Um, you can subscribe and uh, each class is posted after they are completed. Um, as you can see, tonight's class is also being recorded. Um, so, 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 so one of the benefits which he discussed, in which we discussed in class number one, is that, whoops, is that uh, tranquility of the heart, menuchas hanefesh, is one of the things that we're looking for. Um, and if you have, if you have full trust in God, that's one of the things that 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 is a result of that. Uh, but let's get to today's class, right? So Rabbi Pekuda, Rabbi Pekuda takes, takes it from there, and he, we've seen already that he's leading up to this. But his point is, he says, if you really think into them truthfully, he says, ultimately, these seven prerequisites to trust can ultimately be found in their perfection and only with God Almighty. In other words, you may have an iota of some of them or a fraction of some of them or sometimes, sometimes, or in some people or in some relationships or depending how our relationship is going with certain human beings. But we all know, even between spouses, um, we, would all we would all wish and love to have, to have a relationship that would always be the most loving and most caring and always at 100%, but that's not how it works. It waxes and it wanes. And sometimes we trust our spouse more, more than others. Um, and with Hashem, as we're going to see, all seven of these are true all the time. Uh, one of his first orders of business and, and the bulk of today's class is going to be to bring us uh, proof from Tanakh um, that, Hashem, that Hashem commands all seven of these prerequisites in his relationship with human beings to their fullest extent. Um, Joanna, do you want to read for us a little bit? Number 11, whenever you're ready. Um, when we investigate. Okay. Sorry, I had to zoom in a little bit. No worries. When we, when we investigate these seven um, conditions, we will not find them at all in the created beings, but we find them all in the creator. He is compassionate to his creations as written. The Lord is merciful and, and gracious. And now should I not take pity on um, Nineveh, the great city? Okay, so we are now going to go through, one at a time, the seven prerequisites, the seven conditions which we said that there are to having trust in, tr trust in any being. And we're going to point out how God has all seven of these from Tanakh. We're going to point out how God has these, and he expresses these to us each in, their, in abundance um, um, in, in, with, with different examples. So step one was to, that, that the being that we, that we would like to trust in should be compassionate and loving towards us. Right, so, uh, so his two his two examples are his two quotes are number one from Tehillim, right, where it says that Hashem is merciful and gracious. But he doesn't suffice with that. He brings a practical example, which is with the story of Jonah, which many of us may be familiar with from from Yom Kippur, when we talk about um, um, the story of Jonah, where Jonah was sent to 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 uh, warn the city of Nineveh and tell them how. Uh, 
how, how, how terrible would be the wrath of Hashem if they would not do Teshuvah, etc. And Jonah delivers his message, and it seems that it's not uh, being received. And he goes, and he has this episode where he, where he takes uh, refuge under a... Um, anybody know what the tree is in, 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 uh, in English? I know it's a kikayon tree in, in Hebrew. I don't know what, which, which, what tree it is in English. Anybody know that? Feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. I don't know which... which I don't know. Kikayon. In any event, so he takes refuge and uh, God creates a miracle and, and, and the, the, the tree dries up. Um, and I apologize. I, I, I skipped one, part, one crucial part of the story, which was that the tree had only appeared there by a miracle of God when, when Jonah was, was searching for respite from the sun. And Hashem ter- turns to Jonah, who, sorry, and Jonah turns to Hashem after the, the, uh, the, the Kikayon tree dies out. And he turns to Hashem and he says, please, you know, have mercy on me. Take away my life if this is the, the heat that I have to endure. You know, he's like, he's like lamenting to Hashem over the fact that this tree has been destroyed. And Hashem looks at him and he says, um, you have compassion. You have pity on this tree. Asher bin layla haya, bin layla avad, that within one day and a night, it came to be. And within one day and a night, right, overnight, it came to me, and overnight it disappeared. And I should not have compassion on the entire city of Nineveh, which you, you know, which contains X amount of people, um, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's where this quote comes from. Will I not take pity on Nineveh, the great city? Hashem is showing Jonah an important lesson, which is coming to great use here for us in our search for having complete trust in Hashem. That yes, He does indeed have compassion for every single human being. Okay, number two, prerequisite number two that we mentioned was she'eno mis'alim, which means that not only he has love for us, but number two is that he actually wants to do good for us, right? He, he, he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, uh, he doesn't neglect us, right? Again, we will find that Hashem has this and he has this in abundance. Lon, you want to read for us a little bit? Go for it, number 12. And that he never neglects us is written, Behold, the guardian of Israel will neither slumber, slumber nor sleep. That he is all wise and invincible, as written. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who hardened his heart against him and remained unhurt. And yours, O Adonai, are the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. And Adonai, your God, is in the midst, of the mighty one who will save. Right, okay, so I, I, I didn't notice they put them both in one paragraph here, but obviously he's talking here about two different um, prerequisites. Let's go through them one at a time. The first one that he mentions is the fact that Hashem does not neglect us. And for this, of course, there's no, no better place than Psalm 121, which, by the way, is it 121 or 131? I'm assuming their reference is correct. Um, Psalm 121, which is... Um, when we say the uh, right? I turn my I, 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 my eyes gaze gaze towards the heavens, etc. And and uh, as as a follow up, the, 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 the King David in Psalms continues, and he says, "Behold, the guardian of Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep." That Hashem is never sleeping when it comes to the Jewish people. We actually say this in our prayers multiple times. One of the most famous times is in the prayer of Nishmat Kol Chai, which means that that all souls should praise Hashem. It's a special prayer that we add in on, on Shabbat and holidays uh, right before Yishtabach as part, as part of our prayers. So during, during those prayers, I mean, we mentioned many things. It's actually a very moving prayer. I, it's personally one of my favorites. One of my favorite uh, statements there is when we talk about how if all the trees would be quills and if all the, if all the oceans would be inkwells, etc., we would never be able, to, and, and we, we go on to list lots of different things, uh, we would never be able to proclaim the praise of Hashem. And then we say that, behold, Hashem never sleeps. There's, 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 meaning, when it comes to a human guardian, sometimes they're awake, sometimes they're asleep. When it comes to Hashem, Hashem is always awake. Um, and moving on to prerequisite number three. Prerequisite number three is, I'm just going to try to show you guys where it is, that he is all wise and invincible. In other words, that Hashem actually has the strength and the power and the talents and the, the wherewithal to actually do whatever it is that we're trusting in him for, right? So, of course, one of the best places to bring would be from Eov, uh, Job, who, who, who we're, 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 uh, many of you are familiar with the fact that Job uh, uh, is, is one of the books of Tanakh where particularly God's strength and God's uh, uh, wherewithal is discussed because God takes away everything from Job. Job was a man who had everything that he wanted in life. 
Um, now is not time to give his full history. I think many of you are familiar with it. Um, so at one point, Job, Job uh, tells us about Hashem. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hardened his heart against him and remained unhurt? In other words, that Hashem is mighty in strength. That's the point we're bringing here, that Hashem has the ability to do whatever he needs. That's not enough for him. So he brings from Dibri Hayamim, from uh, um, Chronicles, I think it's called, it's, it's called in English, um, that Hashem has greatness, he has power, he has glory, he has victory, he has majesty. This is one of the uh, verses, again, that we say very often in our prayers. We say this during uh, our, our, our weekday prayers, but we also, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when we mention different liturgy that go according to the Aleph and they go through Hashem, very often they're using these words, that Hashem has power, has glory, has victory, has majesty, and these, each, each, of these, each of these words starts with a different one of the Aleph and they, they keep going through the Aleph Bet. So we're, we're, we're bringing verses to show that Hashem is actually omnis- uh, um, not omniscient, um, omnipotent, that he actually has the ability, he has the potency to be able to do whatever it is that we're trusting in him for. Malka, you want to read for us number 13? You have to unmute yourself first. Number 13. It's too small to see, Zushi. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, my God. I forgot that. You had mentioned that last time. Um, and Shimon mentioned he didn't want to read. Um, so, Stephanie, you want to read for us? Just don't forget to unmute yourself. There we go. Okay. Number 13. And- Okay, and that he alone is the one who guides a person from the beginning of his existence and development. As written, he is not your father who has acquainted you, who has acquired you. He has made you and established you, and by you have been upheld from birth. You are he that took me out of my mother's womb. And did you not bear, uh, pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese and the rest of the, the matter? So um, we're going a little bit out of order here for those that are counting or following. Uh, I don't know why, but Rabbi Pekuda chooses to do number, number five here before number four. Um, and that is that this person has to be the sole person who has control over the outcome of, 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 uh, of, of the, the, the one who's looking for trust, the, the boteach, the truster, um, uh, the person you're looking to trust has to, or the being that you're looking to trust has to be the only person, right? All the cards have to be in his deck. Uh, we mentioned that this is one of the ones that might be hard to have for another human being, right? Because very often, yes, the person does their best and they love you and they actually, they're, they're strong and they have the wherewithal to, to do whatever it is, but um, you have to actually overcome it uh, uh, sorry, sorry there, there, there might be something else that overcomes them, uh, some other element or some outside force that might do something else. But specifically with regards to Hashem, we find verse after verse after verse, if we look at number 13, that Hashem, from the day that we're born until the day that, we're, that, that we die, Hashem controls everything that's going on. And Hashem is actually the one that makes everything happen. And, and, and uh, uh, um, he up, I'm, I'm just trying to quote from the verse here. He has upheld us from the birth uh, uh, you are he that took me out of my mother's womb, right? And, di- and did you not pour me out like milk and curl me like cheese, etc.? cetera? Uh, that everything comes um, from Hashem. Okay, now, number four, which we skipped, was that they have to know what's best in your interest, right? Leah, would you like to read for us a little bit? Yes. Go for it. So number 14 um, okay. is addressing point number four, which we mentioned earlier, which is that uh, uh, they have to know what's in your best interest, what's, what, what benefits you in your life. That one's benefit or harm is not in the hands of people, but rather only in the hands of the Creator, as written, who has commanded and it came to pass until the Lord ordained it. Out of the mouth of God, evil and good do not go out of the boundary he has set. And all flesh is like grass, and all their kindness is as the flower of the field. The glass shall dry out, the flower shall wilt, but the word of our God will stand forever. And surely the people are like grass. And we have already explained this sufficiently in the third gate of this book. Okay, so the, 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 uh, the gate, the third gate, the one which directly precedes the one that we're learning now, which is the gate of trust, um, the, the prior gate, was called the gate of serving God. Um, and of course, there he has to talk a lot about God's uh, 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 omnipotence and, and why we would serve God and how we would serve God, etc. Um, particularly here, 
His point is that he actually that 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 that, that Hashem created the entire world, um, and that and that no matter what it is that's happening in this world is coming from Hashem. Um, one of the things which we which we pointed out uh, uh, in in the introduction comes very much to mind here, which is that if you look through the narrative in Genesis of the creation of the world, it's interesting to note that in addition to obviously the, the Torah telling us that Hashem created this, created that, you know, created the entire world, it's interesting to note that, that the Torah also feels the need for us to know that everything that Hashem uh, 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 said then actually came to pass. Everything that Hashem willed into being actually came into existence. Um, we see this with two words, which repeat themselves pretty much every day of the six days of creation, uh, sometimes even twice per day. And those words are, Vayehi chen, and it was so. Um, so it will say that Hashem said, let there be light, and then there was light. Hashem said, let the earth spread forth with vegetation and uh, grass and trees and uh, trees to bear fruit, etc., 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 and it was so. And the Torah kind of feels the need to emphasize to us that each time Hashem wanted something to be, it actually came into being. That lesson becomes very powerful here that we should recognize that whatever it is that we want to happen in this world, uh, sorry, whatever it is that Hashem wants to happen in this world actually happens. And nothing happens in this world without Hashem wanting it to happen. Um, very often, if this was a, philo a philosophical class, uh, uh, one of the questions that would be brought up here is so then where do negative things come from, right? Where, where do... Uh, uh, things that expressly contradict the will of Hashem come from. So for instance, if one of us chooses to specifically go against one of the commandments of Hashem, which he says in his Torah, how do we get that power? How do we get that energy to even do that? But I'll, I'll leave that as powerful as a question as it is. I'll leave that aside for right now. Um, for those of you that were, that were at the Tanya class, we discussed at a length. It was a very powerful discussion. Um, number 15. Marguerite, you want to read for us a little bit? Well, uh, uh, hold on, Marguerite, you're, you're not unmuted. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry. This has to happen at least once per class. So. <laughs> unmute now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Uh, that his generosity is universal and his kindness is all embracing. As written, the Lord is good to all and his mercies are on all his works. Tehillim 145.9. And who gives food to all flesh for his kindness endures forever. The Heading 136, 25. And you open your hand and satisfy every living thing with will. The good he bestows is not in a stingy way according to basic needs, but rather like his will. The okay, anybody recognize uh, the verses, at least from Psalm 145? They should be very uh, recognizable to us. They're from Ashrei. Psalm 145 is also known as Ashrei. Ashrei, 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 Exactly. We say it as part of our prayers every single day. In fact, we say it twice in the morning, in, in, in the morning prayer and then once in the afternoon in the Mincha service. Um, and the, the verses that he's quoting here is, now, because of course he's trying to show that Hashem is good and that everything that comes down from Hashem is good. Tov Hashem lakol, Hashem is good to all. Berachim lakol masam, and he is merciful to all of his creations. And then he says that Hashem, then he quotes from, from, uh, uh, 136, but then he, he, he goes back to Poteach et Yadecha, which is the one that many people have a custom to raise their hands when they say that. Poteach et Yadecha, we say Hashem should open up his hands and give us our sustenance, give us our livelihood. Um, and we, so men, many people have the custom to raise their hands towards heaven when they do so to show open hands, kind of reflecting the open hands that Hashem shows towards us. Um, I will also mention another point that we're reiterating from the introduction. Uh, which is that, again, in, in the narrative in Genesis, the second thing which we find repeat itself through every day of the days of creation is, is that in addition to it always saying, and it was so, that, Hashem actually, that it actually came to be, whatever Hashem wanted actually came to be, we also, beyond that, afterwards we read, that Hashem saw that it was good. We see this over and over again. And Hashem saw, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. It's it's almost always immediately before um, the day ends, and it says by Yerev by Yivoker Yom Rishon by Yerev by Yivoker Yom Sheni. It was an evening and a morning, and then day one, day two, day three, day four. Immediately prior to that, it says every day and once even twice by Yar Elokim Kitov that Hashem saw that it was good, which is interesting. Again, it seems to me that there's an agenda that the Torah is trying to show us that Hashem didn't just create the world. It's not just that he's omnipotent, that he has the ability to do whatever he wants when it comes to creating the world and that it will be so, but that in addition to that, everything that he does is actually good. 
This is one that is often challenged emotionally more than philosophically, because whenever we suffer a tragedy in our lives, it's very, very difficult to wrap our brains around it and figure out how can that be good when it comes down from Hashem. And this will be discussed more at length later in the work. Um, okay. But really, he finishes off here. I'm just looking at my book to see till where I want to go here. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're, we're almost right, 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 right about where I want to go to. Um, looking to see if anybody... Steve, you want to read for us here, number 16 and 17? Yes. But really, the intellect can infer that these seven conditions exist in the Creator and not in the created beings, as he explains in the next chapter. And therefore, I have brought these verses from Scripture only as a remembrance. Okay, so hold on. Hold on. Before you keep going, this is a very, very important point. Some of you are sitting here and they're like, all ah, right, more Scripture, more verses, as if I didn't know already that the Torah believes that God is the best, right? Now, meaning we all know that and we all believe that, but we were looking for a little more and he's going to get to that. He's going to get to that. But he wants to start off by showing you, he says, I just want to show you that the Torah has told us this over and over again about Hashem and these seven points specifically, the seven points that, I'm, that I've mentioned to you, in which I've constructed logically, that they would be a prerequisite for trusting in someone. The Torah actually shows that to us and says that these things exist with regards to Hashem. And he's bringing you multiple verses, and there's many more, by the way. There's many more, and there's some that maybe would have even been a better proof, and maybe, you know, there's, there's different commentary on his, on his uh, work here uh, that discuss why he brought this verse and not that verse, etc. And maybe he did have certain ones in mind or not others. His point is, that's not where it stops. These things are also logical inferences. When you talk about Hashem, we can logically deduce that if there's a creator that created the entire world, these seven things uh, uh, are true about him. And that will be the topic of next week's lesson, which will be explained in the next chapter, as the Torah's Lubavos pointed out to us. Steve, keep reading. Okay, when one clarifies this to himself, and his recognition in the true kindness of the creator will be strong. He will place his trust in him, give himself completely to him, and leave guidance of his life to him. Never suspect him and his judgments, nor be, accept, be upset by what he has chosen for him. As David said, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And, we say that every week during Abdullah. Right. I found trouble and sorrow and call upon the name of the Lord. Right, so the Torah's Levavos here, which is the TL in parentheses here, um, points out that, that these two, why does he bring two separate verses? One verse for the good and one verse for the bad. We will praise Hashem for the good and we will praise Hashem for the bad if we actually have these seven points down pat and we recognize that based on that we should have complete trust in Hashem. But uh, this, this last paragraph which, with which he ends chapter two of his work, um, or chapter two of gate four of his work, um, is where the, the Chobos HaLevavos, this is a stylistic choice that he made where he, he, he keeps reiterating the point which he made in his introduction as he goes through it. He wants to remind you that's why we just did this particular exercise. That's why we did this particular exercise because we're trying to get to that point. In the introduction, if you remember, he, he mentioned that, that um, some of the benefits to trusting in Hashem will be the, uh, 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 avoiding the rat race, as we called it. In other words, we won't be so busy chasing where does our livelihood come from? Uh, what's going to be? My business just shut down. I don't have enough money for retirement. I got, I got to keep working. Whatever it is, the worries that there, are, that there are in our mind, a lot of those worries come from not, not thinking often enough about these seven points and how they should actually lead to a trust in Hashem. Now, uh, of course, you might still have a challenge because, oh, so far we only will. Okay, so if the Torah verses weren't enough for you, he's going to move on to logical understanding that Hashem has all seven of these points. And that will be the topic of next week's plan. But at least for now, he wants, he wants to recap that if we can actually believe these seven, these verses that I've brought for these seven points, believe that Hashem has these seven points, then why would I trust in anything else? Why would I even believe that I should, meaning why should I spend so much time worrying about things, working on things he's going to talk about later? Why we should still invest our own effort, that's important. But why would I spend so much time worrying and stressing out about life when really I could just put my trust in Hashem because really he controls everything anyways. With this, we'll conclude today's class. I'd love to take some questions. Let me see if in the chat here there are some questions. Um, 